This evening we consider the theme, our God is a great conqueror and glorious deliverer. And this is a wonderful needed change uh, from the lament psalm that we saw last week. Even though that lament psalm uh, was important for some of us to listen to, you know, last week we saw how God's people can fall into despair. You know, all Christians will feel sad, and some Christians will feel even very deep, piercing sorrow and suffering. But the psalm that we saw, Psalm 42, teaches us to hope in God. Even though we're going through tough times, He is our salvation. Now, today, as we look at Psalm 68, it examines that salvation. So, Psalm 42 may have told us to look to God for salvation, but Psalm 68 here describes the kind of joy and salvation and victory that one day we will have. And, you know, this psalm is a triumphant psalm. It is partially an imprecatory psalm, meaning it calls for God to put His judgment on the wicked. So for anyone, anyone who has earthly or spiritual enemies, for anyone who goes through deep trials because of others, well, this psalm shouts victory. You know, one day, one day, God's enemies will be punished. God's people will be vindicated. And you know what? Liberated people ought to rejoice. Liberated, freed people, people who experience victory in Christ will have that sense of joy. You know, when the Allied forces, when they landed in Normandy, uh, they fought against the Nazis. You know, the people were so grateful. Even the people of Paris, at the liberation of Paris, you know, these joyful citizens, they all came to the soldiers. You know, they gave them wine. They gave them flowers. Uh, they even gave them kisses. They were so joyful. They shouted in victory when the Nazis were defeated. So we see that from despair, God's people can change to delight. From depression, God's people can have a sense of delirium, happiness. And what we want to notice here is that deliverance from our enemies and from life's trials from the devil, from sin, this deliverance only comes by Christ conquering. They are related. There's no deliverance without someone being conquered. You know, when Jesus conquered death and sin, He freed us from death and sin. He freed us from the power of the devil. So in our earthly despair, when we know that God has delivered us, uh, there will one day be that time when all knees shall bow and worship Christ. When we know that, then we can rejoice. We think about our past deliverance. We're saved from sin. We also think about that final, final judgment where we will be vindicated, and we also rejoice. So we rejoice when we look to the past. We rejoice when we look to the future. Now, this psalm's big picture is this. Our God is worthy to be praised because He's delivered His people in the past and gives them present and future victory as their King. Therefore, let all people worship Him. So, this is what we will examine in four points. So, firstly, our God is worthy to be praised. So, verse 4 says, Sing unto God, sing praises to His name. Extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name, Yah, and rejoice before Him. Now, we look at this, and we cannot run away uh, without noticing that twice it says sing, once it says extol. Why? Because God is powerful, and it also speaks about rejoice. Sing, sing, extol, rejoice. This basically tells us that our God, who is in heaven, is worthy to be praised. Now, this psalm has no title apart from the fact 
that it was written by David, but most scholars agree what the historical context was when it was written by David. And it was written when the ark was returned to Jerusalem. Uh, for interest's sake, this is what you see in 2 Samuel 6. Now, the Ark of the Covenant symbolized God's presence on earth. You know, in that box, it contained the Ten Commandments, the revealed will of God. It also contained the budding rod of Aaron, which symbolized God's leading of his people through his officers. And there was also the pot of manna, which was, which was a reminder to God's people that God always provided for him. Now, each of these three items inside the box would judge God's people. You know, immediately after receiving the Ten Commandments from God, they went to build the golden calf. Fail, right? They also refused God's appointed leaders. They wanted to return back uh, to Egypt. And even though daily they received this bread from heaven, they complained, oh, there's no garlic, there's no onions, there are no leeks, you know, we want meat. And so if God were to take issue with them for these three things, he could have judged them. But what God did is that he covered this box with the mercy seat. He covered these items to show that he forgave his people. He would not accuse them. So when we take a look at the Ark of the Covenant, it represented God's justice and mercy all in one place. Mercy to his people, but judgment to his enemies. You know, Psalm 68 was written on the occasion of the return of the Ark. The Philistines, previously they had stolen it, but they experienced so much of God's judgment so badly that they quickly returned it. And so when the ark was returned back to Israel, there was great rejoicing. You know, the musicians and the singers, they praised God because he is worthy to be praised. And as we look through this psalm, we see two reasons why he is worthy to be praised. And this is consistently repeated throughout the psalm, right? That he is... Firstly, a great conqueror, and secondly, a glorious deliverer. And we remember that you can't have one without the other. When he destroys his enemies, he delivers his people. When he delivers his people, he does it by conquering their enemies. So we want to take a look in this introduction here that he is a great conqueror. Even verse 1 says, let God arise, not just stand up, but arise to go to war. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Now, the reason why scholars think that this was written at the return of the ark is because these words here in verse 1, they are the same phrase, the same words used in Numbers 10, 35. When Israel left Sinai, after they had built the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, then they carried the Ark and they set out into the wilderness. And verse 35 of Numbers 10 says, And it came to pass when the Ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. So as they set off on their journey, the Ark was in front right, of the entire procession, showing that God was leading them. And this was a warning uh, to the enemies. You know, they carried the ark. It was in one sense saying, God is coming. Skedaddle, scram, get away, right? And so these words, right, would have been used uh, pro possibly, probably daily. Each day when they broke camp and they set off, these were the words that they were used every day. For 40 years, Israel started her day with these words, rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And it was a reminder to Israel that when God arose to act, 
Nothing could stand in his way. You know, Pharaoh himself, uh, he could not stand, you know, after the 10 plagues. The Jordan River, when the ark went in, you know, as the priest stepped on it, the water stopped flowing. Even when the ark went around Jericho, what happened? The walls fell. So when God arises, nothing, nothing can stop him. And that is why he should be praised. Because compared to him, his enemies are powerless. They will never triumph. You know, verse 2 says, As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. And so here, God is so powerful that wicked men are described as smoke and wax. How does smoke disappear? You blow it away. It's that easy. Right? How does wax melt? You just light a fire and it just melts, right? So the wicked are like that compared to God. When he acts, he will destroy them. He will burn them up. They will completely be annihilated. That is how he conquers. But we also see that God is a glorious deliverer. You know, his people are blessed by him. He destroys his enemies, but he cares for his people. Verse 3, it tells us his people to be glad and to rejoice exceedingly. And the reason that we see here is because God allows us into his presence. It says here, let them rejoice before him. So you see a contrast. The wicked and all the enemies like smoke and wax right? They are driven from his presence, but the people are welcome before his presence. And that is why they rejoice exceedingly because he welcomes them, he loves them, and they sing. Verse 4, as we saw in the beginning, sing, sing, extol, rejoice. This is what they do because he is Jehovah. He is Yah the covenant-keeping God. He is the God that rides upon the heavens. Now, the psalmist used this name, Jehovah, and he used this phrase to show the distinction between God and his power and the gods of the Canaanites. You know, this phrase, you know, he rides upon the heavens, this was a phrase that was used of Baal by the Canaanites, that he is a rider on the clouds. But here, the real powerful God that is in the heaven above is not Baal, but it is Jehovah. He is the one who really rides. He's higher. But we see here, though he is higher than the heavens, he is near to his people. So God is not just a great uh, conqueror. He's a glorious deliverer because verse 5 says, even though he is high above in heaven, in his holy habitation, he looks and he sees the fatherless. He is a judge of the widows. He takes care of them. He is not far removed. You know, when the Baal prophets were crying out for Baal, right, in their competition with Elijah, what were they doing? They were cutting themselves, screaming and crying and jumping because Baal wouldn't hear them. God, even though he is higher above everyone else, yet he hears and he knows. He helps the weak. He puts the lonely in families. He frees prisoners of war. Of course, by contrast, those who rebel against him, they perish in the wilderness. So as we we see here that God is worthy to be praised, why? Because he is a great conqueror, he is a glorious deliverer, and these two themes are seen throughout the psalm. So secondly, we want to see how God has conquered and how God has delivered in the past. So in verses 7 to 17, the psalmist here is recounting, remembering what happened in the past. When Israel was delivered from Egypt, and when they entered into the promised land. So these historical events, they uh, both featured the ark of God. Now during these times, God delivered his people. Verse seven, O God, 
when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness. So it's speaking about the wilderness and how God was in front, leading and guiding the people. And in verse 8, the psalmist describes the power of God. When they were on Mount Sinai, uh, the earth shook. The heavens dropped at God's presence. There was a great earthquake at Sinai. You know, if you remember when Israel met with God at Sinai, before they did for several days, they were called to fast. And then there was a fence that was put around the mountain so the people could not touch it. But when God finally came and he spoke, there was a great earthquake, you know, fire and lightning, right, came on top of the mountain and blackened it. You know, yes, the people were fearful, but God was here coming to his people and saying, I am your powerful God. I can do all things. You are now my people. I am now your God. And, and this is why when they went through the wilderness, God took care of them. You know, verses 9 to 10 say how he cared for them. He sent plentiful rain to restore his people. He rained manna to them. He rained water out of the rock. He rained even quail, meat from heaven. He was gracious to them. This happened in the past. But also in the past, as Israel was remembering, God also greatly conquered their enemies. Verse 11, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Now, the word here refers to God's command to the Israelites to rise up and fight. You know, when Israel went forth with the ark in front of them, uh, the Red Sea split. Then the Egyptians drowned. And what happened after that? The Lord gave the word to cross. After they cross, the Egyptians were drowned. Then great was the company that published glad tidings. Miriam sang her song of praise. The whole of Israel with tambourines, they were praising God heartily because God had rescued them. Similarly, when David beat Goliath, uh, what did the women do? The great company of Israel women, they sang praises. Oh, you know, uh, David has slain his ten thousands. So every time God had led them out of Egypt and into Canaan, when there was conquering, it led to great rejoicing. And even verse 12 shows how God conquered. The armies fled hastily. You know, Israel triumphed over all of her enemies. So much so that if you remember when they came to Jericho, Rahab said, Psst, everyone knows how you conquered people in the wilderness. We're all afraid of you. Everyone knew that. And that is why even the Gibeonites, when they came, they came with, you know, uh, tattered clothes and moldy bread to say, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to be your enemies. Make a treaty with us. Because they all heard how powerful God was, how Israel had conquered in the wilderness, and they didn't want to be conquered. So, we see that God has conquered, has delivered his people in the past. He has conquered his enemies. And as a result, the people benefited. You know, they were once slaves. Verse 13, they were, you know, those who were like servants, washing pots and pans. But now they were delivered by God. And they were even given this great inheritance. God conquered Canaan for them. He even gave them the mountains, the snow-capped mountains of Salmon, and he gave them the inheritance of Bashan in the north. You know, God was so powerful. The way he conquered, it's described in verse 17 as how he had 20,000 chariots driven by thousands of warrior angels. That is how powerful God is. That is how he conquered his enemies in the past and delivered his people in the past. But the psalm now speaks thirdly about how God was giving them 
current victory as their king. So not only in history, but presently as the ark was being moved back to Jerusalem into the tabernacle. Verse 18 speaks of this, uh, you could say, uh, ascension, coronation of God back into the temple. It says, thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. So this occasion for the musicians and the singing in Psalm 68 is God's enthronement. The ark was being carried back into the holy mountain because God came back victorious. You know, when the Philistines, when they first took the ark, um, they fell really sick. And so now they were returning the ark. They were giving gifts of gold. So if you remember the story, when the ark was first taken, it was a shameful time for Israel. They suffered. It was a time when God's glory departed. It was Ichabod. But even during those times of despair, God was working. So the Philistines captured the ark. If you remember the story, they put it into the temple of Dagon. That's the half fish, half man god that the Philistines worship. And the reason why they did that was to show, aha, Jehovah, the God of the Israelites, has been captured. Our Dagon is more powerful. So the ark of God, the symbol of God, was placed into the temple kind of like a tribute, right? You come and you are kneeling before, you know, the statue of Dagon because the captors uh, made Jehovah captive. Now, what happened was the statue of Dagon the next morning, if you remember the story, it fell down, face down, as if bowing to the ark. So the Philistines took it and put it back upright. The next day, the statue had fallen over again. This time, the head broke off. This time, the hands broke off. Why no feet? Because he was a mermaid. All that was left of Dagon, the Bible says it very clearly was, he was a stump. Go check, right? Second Samuel 6, he was a stump, right? And not just that, but the Philistines in Ashdod thereafter, they were struck by a plague. Tumors covered their entire bodies. Many died, many were in pain. He led captivity captive. He conquered them. And so the Philistines, feeling defeated, having this ark of God, they now wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to return it. The presence of God was too terrible for them. And they returned the ark of God with gifts of gold, nuggets, big, huge nuggets of gold, large chunks so when the ark was returned with all of this gold, the people now realized how God destroyed his enemies, how he loaded them with benefits. And this was the assurance we see in verse 21 that such a God, such a God who was able to do this, he would crush the head of his enemies, even the fiercest enemies, or even those with a hairy scalp, right? Now, in ancient times, uh, fearsome warriors all wore their hair long and shaggy for it to be a fearsome sight. But we learn here that God himself, he will crush every hairy scalp that rebels against him. God even chases them down. Verse 22, you know, they can run all the way to Bashan. They can go west to the sea. But verse 23, there's no escape. When God chooses to arise and conquer, there will be carnage. You know, we see here in verse 23, God's enemies will be slain in such numbers that we will wade in blood. And dogs also, their tongues will be dipped in blood. They'll be licking up the blood. 
Now, for some of us who hear this and we think of God in his might and in his conquering, we, 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 we get to be a bit uncomfortable. You know, we're talking about the Christian God, aren't we? How come, you know, the Bible speaks about him in such a manner? And we don't dare to rejoice in such a God, but as you see here, the Israelites in verses 24 to 28, they rejoice victoriously. The ark was back. There was praise. They celebrated as the ark was put back into the sanctuary. The singers, the musicians, they came forth. The maidens even played tambourines. You know, in 2 Samuel 6, this is when King David joined them. He did not dress in his kingly robes. He put them aside. He was wearing a linen ephod, the simple garment of the priests. And all of Israel, they were worshiping God. Verse 27 says they came from the deep south from Benjamin and Judah. They came even from the far north, Naphtali and Zebulun, and their praises showed the hope that they had in this God, that God strengthens us. He makes us powerful, and their wish was that all kings and nations would worship God. Their wish was that God would conquer all of them, those as far as Egypt and Ethiopia, you know, historic enemies, they were aspiring. Their desire was that God would rise up and as a king conquer the entire world. Dearly beloved, what is our attitude towards this king? Is this a desire of ours? And the thing is, we desire that all people will worship him one day. Every knee shall bow, whether they be on earth or under the earth. They will bow willingly or unwillingly. Christ at his first coming came to be a sacrifice for sinners. He came in his mercy, right? But in his second coming, he will come with great might. You know, in verses 32 to 35, there's a call here for everyone to worship God. You know, God conquered the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Canaanites, and the Philistines. Now God is enthroned, and the desire here of the people is that all kingdoms would worship him. All right? Verse 32 invokes all kingdoms of the earth. And all kingdoms must worship because God has ascended on high, the heaven of heavens. He speaks powerfully from there. So as I said, you know, sometimes Christians look at Psalms like this where God speaks about destroying enemies. We become a bit uncomfortable. How can we speak like that? I thought God was a God of grace and mercy. We think, you know, New Testament Christians, we can't think about God conquering his enemies like that. You know, we like the parts that speak about God caring for people. We cringe about the parts that speak about all that talk of blood. But, as I said earlier, Christ is not our deliverer if he does not conquer. All right? Now, we see here the Christological context. Verse 18 is quoted in Ephesians 4, verse 7 and 8. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So very clearly, God has delivered us. When he came the first time, he conquered sin, he conquered death, he died, he ascended into heaven, and he gave the gift of his spirit and spiritual gifts to his church that all of us might grow. It's not the gift of gold and silver, large chunks, right? But it's the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God has given because he cares for us and he is helping us as a kingdom through these spiritual gifts to grow bigger and bigger. But as we consider this, we can never forget that Christ conquers. When he came the first time, yes, he died, but he conquered death 
and hell. When he comes the second time, he comes in all of his might. For any of those who say, I like the New Testament better than the Old Testament because the New Testament is more gracious, you guys probably have never read the book of Revelation because in the book of Revelation, the judgment there is far worse than any of the judgments that you see in the Old Testament. When the seal and bold judgments are sent by God, blood and destruction are involved. You know, after God destroys Babylon the Great, we even see God's people in the book of Revelation rejoicing because she had killed all the prophets and all the saints. The Bible tells us she, she was drunk with their blood. So when she was finally killed, God's people rejoiced in Revelation 19 where they say, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And the one who did this conquering, this God here, this was Jesus. So Jesus was not just the suffering savior, the little baby who was born to give of his life, but he is also the conquering king who conquers death. You know, Jesus shows as that ark of God, mercy and justice in one place. He shows mercy to those who would come to him. He took God's judgment upon himself. You know, three hours of darkness and agony, all for the sake of God's people, in order to cover, to cover the judgment of God towards them. But to the enemies, that mercy seat is removed and the judgment of God is poured out to those who refuse mercy. He uncovers justice. And just as the seals were broken, just as God's judgment poured out from the scrolls, and just as the bowls were broken to unleash vengeance, that ark of God, Jesus, when he comes, he will march forth and destroy uh, his enemies. And so as we look at this psalm, what does it teach us? For those who are in times of despair, when the glory has departed, Ichabod, you may be going through some sin, grievous sin, some trial, but yet we are people who in the midst of this can rejoice. When we remember all of his past deliverances, when he saved us, he loved us, he cares for us. And when we remember that one day, Jesus is coming to right all wrongs, even the wrongs that we have committed, even the wrongs that have been committed against us, he comes to right all wrongs and he will conquer. This gives believers a sense of hope. Not only has he rescued us, but he will vindicate one day. And although we do suffer, it seems as if God's glory has departed in our lives. It's, it's Ichabod. But God is working. The ark was with the Philistines wreaking havoc there. It's an assurance that one day he rights all wrongs. Sin, the devil, death, the shame that you're experiencing now. Jesus will one day banish all of this to the deepest pit and the lake of fire, and God's people will have no longer any shame, only shouts of victory. I know when we look at a psalm like this, talking about the past, talking about history, talking about the future, perhaps it's very hard for us to grasp some of these things. But as we spoke on Psalm 42 last week, and we acknowledge that there are some who are going through despair, and Psalm 42 says, hope thou in God, for he is the light of your countenance, salvation, right? 
this is the salvation that is spoken of, that you're saved, there's no more shame, and if you do feel something, there will be God's final victory. And He conquers, and He's victorious. So let that be an assurance to us, especially as we go through our various struggles. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the assurance in your word that we never need be ashamed, that all the shame and the guilt of our sins and wrongdoings have been placed on Christ and he has taken them all. And though we do struggle at times, help us to be assured of that final victory when all things shall be made right. We do pray for any who struggle with sin, with despair, with sorrow, with shame, even at this time, that they will look to Christ and find assurance for themselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.